Thank you very much. So tonight I'd like to talk to you about wearable computing. And most of the time, when people talk about wearable computing, they actually mean something like this. Now that's my computer from 1994. It consists of a heads-up display, a one-handed keyboard, and in the shoulder satchel is a computer, a car cell phone, those big old things, and a motorcycle battery. The system weighed over four kilograms. Now, I would wear this as part of my daily life, and if you saw me walking on the street, you'd see this. And what people would do is ask me the question, Thad, how can you see with that thing on your face? And I respond, well, actually, it seems to me as if I'm seeing through the computer. Uh, next slide, if we could. And um, so this is kind of what I saw. So it seems to me like I can actually see through the display to the real world. It's an overlay. Now, it's actually a visual illusion with the human uh, visual system. It, uh, the human visual system shares the image from both eyes and overlays them. And I can show you that illusion tonight. So what I want you to do is I want you to close your right eye and hold up your thumb like this. Now bring your thumb closer to your uh, left eye until you actually occlude me so you can't see me anymore. Now hold that pose for a second. Okay, Glass, take a picture. <laughs> I, I have to show to my dean that I actually do a good job on these talks. <laughs> Um, but now, back to the experiment. Uh, back, to, back to the experiment at hand. So you have your right eye closed, you have your, your, your thumb up, you're including me, and now open your right eye, and suddenly it seems like you can see both your thumb and me at the same time. If we put the, uh, some optics in front of your thumb, we could then actually have your thumb and me at the same focal distance. And that's what we're doing with these head-up displays. We're making it so you can see both the text or graphics or whatever, and the real world at the same time. Now, fortunately, over the next uh, uh, few years, in 2013, we have something much different. This is Google Glass, what I'm wearing tonight. And Glass actually has a transparent display. When I actually, I'm going to come up here and abuse the front row. When you actually look in my eye here, you can actually see my people through the display. Right? Actually, when I turn it on, you can actually see the display too. Because um, it's transparent, both you and I can see it. But it's also mounted high above your pupil. It's basically mounted where the rear view mirror of your car would be mounted. And so it allows you to see the information when you need it, ignore it when you don't. And that's a very powerful thing. However, tonight, I want to talk to you about a very different type of wearable computer. Most of you have wearable computers on you right now. For example, when you take your, your smartphone and hook up your music to it or your MP3 player and go jogging, that's a wearable computer. It's a device that's being used to complement an action you're doing in the real world. Now, we've created a new type of wearable computer at Georgia Tech uh, that I'm very excited about. Georgia Tech is my university. And, um, I'd like to share, with it, uh, share that with you tonight. Now, how many of you actually know how to play a musical instrument? Raise your hand. A good bit of you. That's kind of what I expect from an audience like this. Now, also, I would actually like to know how many of you have actually tried to learn a musical instrument but failed to do so? Raise your hand. Right. So I'm actually a pretty good saxophone player. <laughs> I got two hands over there. Uh, I'm a pretty good saxophone player, but I also tried to learn piano. The problem is that in trying to learn piano, I got very discouraged because you have to repeat the same songs over and over again to learn the muscle memory you need to really play a song. And so it takes a while to get to something that actually sounds musical. What well, if I told you I can give you the muscle memory of how to play a melody on a, on a piano without your actively attending it? What well, if I told you the next two or three TED Talks you could actually learn the right hand for the melody for Amazing Grace. Well, that's what we've seemed to have discovered here. This is something called the Mobile Music Touch. It's a one-handed glove, it's fingerless, but it also hooks up wirelessly to your MP3 player or your mobile phone or whatever mobile device you have that plays music. And the idea here is that it's going to uh, actually tap your fingers as you hear each note played. So to be precise, you load in the song you want to learn, say, Ode to Joy, or Dashing Through the Snow, whatever else. And 
you hear the song repeated again and again in your earpiece, earbuds, Bluetooth headset, whatever, and as each note is played, you feel it tapped on your finger. And it turns out that in about 30 minutes, you can learn 45 notes of a, of a tune. Now, this is really quite exciting, and, and uh, it doesn't sound like this should work. So let me describe to you the experiment that we did that really showed us this was possible. So, so the experiment we do is we bring in a, a new participant, we put the glove on their hand, and then we sit them down and we show them uh, a song being played on a piano keyboard like the one you see here. Now beneath each key is a light. And so as the song plays, they hear it, they feel it, and they see the note on the keyboard. And we do this once, only once. Right? They see the song, and then they're supposed to try to repeat it. Now of course, they do a very bad job. These are mostly non-musicians we're recruiting. And uh, they make lots of errors. Then for the next 30 minutes, we give them some distraction task. Something like uh, re uh, trying the reading comprehension section of a graduate entrance exam. This really makes them attend to this distraction task. And we have two groups. One's a control group and one's experimental. The control group just hears the same song being played over and over again, the song they're trying to learn. The experimental group, they are actually hearing the song over and over again, but also feeling the taps on the fingers. After 30 minutes, the people, both people try to come back, we take off the glove, and they try to repeat the song. The people in the control group who just heard the audio, they tend to do poorly. Matter of fact, they tend to do even worse than their original attempt. The people who actually had the tapping on their fingers tend to do quite well. Matter of fact, most often, they'll play through the song perfectly. Now, I don't mean anything about rhythm or artistry here at all. All I mean is that they're repeating the button pressing task correctly, the right note followed by the right note. Now, when you get something that's so surprising like this, the fact that you could actually learn a complex mechanical task without actively attending to it goes against a lot of what we know about learning. So, we did the experiment five more times. Uh, on th with three different sets of grad students on two different continents. And what we did is try to find all the different ways we could extinguish the effect, all the different distractors that might affect it. And so we had people watching video while they felt the, the thing tapping on their fingers, uh, reading email. We had people doing the ma solving mathematical equations on the graduate entrance exam. We had people doing a scavenger hunt, thinking that the mechanical motion might mask the hand movement, and they, couldn't, and they couldn't actually get the effect that way. But time and time again, every experiment we did, we continued to get the effect. Um, that really told us this idea of passive haptic learning, the idea that you can actually get some learning without this active attention, was really quite uh, possible. Now, when we get to, got to that stage, where we were like, what, what do we do with this? This is exciting, what do we do with it? Well, one of the things we decided to do is tell the world. This is us actually live on CNN. We decided that we were going to uh, try to actually do this demonstration of passive haptic learning, learning uh, on a CNN segment. Now, I don't suggest doing a technology demonstration live on CNN. <laughs> it's asking for trouble. However, uh, we went into the, into the studio and got Chad Myers. Chad Myers is their meteorologist. Now, he's in front of 20 million people a day and uh, does the weather, and that day we had a hurricane in the Gulf of Mexico. And so he was tracking the hurricane, and we put this glove on his hand while he's busy, you know, mousing and doing stuff, and just said, okay, in a little while we're going to bring you out on camera, and you're going to have your debut as a pianist. Chad Myers has no musical talent whatsoever. He'll admit so uh, uh, shortly, but, uh, and you'll actually be able to see him get stage fright. Uh, he, now, this is a man who does the weather every day, and you'll see him come up to the piano and get stage fright and uh, try to back out. The other thing I want you to notice, though, is that as I play this segment, um, he doesn't have actually have to look at his fingers or the keys. So if we could go ahead and play the uh, uh, segment. Chad has had this glove on for how long now? <laughs> About 45 minutes. About 45 minutes. What was the song? Well, he, this is what the song would have sounded like. Okay, that's, that's before. That, that, that is my musical repertoire. Okay. okay, that's how good I can do it. So, he's had the glove on for 45 yeah, so minutes. And what it, was the song, it, by it, the way? It, I, I, it's oh, Joy. It's, it's oh, Beethoven's Oh, this ought to be good. <laughs> <laughs> All 
All right, Ted. Okay. This thing buzzed. <laughs> and at all I no, did... I was getting nervous. All I did was I played on my mouse. Okay. I did my little hurricane stuff. You were doing other stuff. things. I did my hurricane <laughs> stuff, and it was buzzing on my fingers. You were working. I would see if I could do it. Notice how tender he kidding. was at first. <laughs> Are you kidding me? He's like, oh my word. Now, do you happening. have any talent, a background in music, ever played the piano? <laughs> and that's you didn't it. know that song, Never. correct? No, I, no. I've heard it but I wouldn't know what fingers to use. And I always thought I had to go back and forth. No, I was hoping for like this Liberace. Like, wow. watch, <laughs> that watch, is watch. clearly proof that it, this it, thing It works. just buzzed. Middle, middle, up, down, down, doesn't even know down, how to explain down. it. Oh. And I must say that as a subject, um, it's really scary. You walk up the piano, you get stage fright, you put down your finger, you have the first place mark, so you know where to put the first finger. You start playing, it's like your hand is possessed. It's really weird. Um, I did this at a talk once. Uh, I gave a talk on the subject at my major um, conference and uh, used myself as a subject and afterwards went up and played it and, and I really didn't think it was going to work either, but it, it does. It seems to work consistently. Now, uh, now we've done the passive haptic learning. We've actually had this at open houses at Georgia Tech. This is when people come in from industry and the local community and see what sort of research we're working on. And we met a woman by the name of Dr. Debbie Bacchus, who's the rehabilitation head at the Shepherd Center. Now, the Shepherd Center is a place for traumatic spinal cord injury and traumatic brain injury. And Debbie said, can I try that glove with my patients with tetraplegia? And I was very confused. I'm like, Debbie, why do you want to try to teach people who are paralyzed how to play piano? She said, no, no, you don't understand. Tetraplegia just means that all four limbs are affected. Right? These people still have some sensation, some dexterity. I'm working with people with partial spinal cord injuries. They don't have a full break. They can still get some sensation. Now, she uh, thought that uh, possibly these folks might get some benefit from it. In particular, she was working with people who are a year past injury. And with spinal cord injury, what is the common thought out there is that your rehabilitation effect, your improvement, it goes up asymptotically until you reach some max around one year and then you don't get any improvements. But Debbie was seeing in her lab that these folks were actually still getting some improvements if she did intensive therapy with them, even a year post-injury. So she was wondering, um, perhaps these people might be able to get some benefit passively. And this is particularly important because insurance companies stop paying for rehabilitation benefits after a year because they think there's no improvement. And so indeed we tried it. This is my student, Tanya Marco, and she started a pilot study with uh, folks with partial spinal cord injury. And we had two conditions. One is the control condition where these folks just tried normal piano lessons on the piano you saw about uh, three times a week, 30 minutes a day. Our experimental condition had that, plus five times a week for two hours a day, at least they'd actually have this glove on and it'd be tapping on their fingers. And they'd learn eight songs over eight weeks. And we knew we had something when one of our pilot subjects came in waving his middle finger. She, he said, Tanya, Tanya, look what I can do. Tanya's like, that's very nice. You gotta get back to the, to the lesson. No, Tanya, you don't understand. This is a major life change for me. Do you know how long I've been wanting, wanting to flip off my physical therapist? <laughs> Tanya's like, yes, I, that's, that's very nice. I, I get it. It's like, no, no, you don't get it. When I came in here, my hands were clawed like this. And I couldn't articulate the fingers separately. Now I can. You need to test this. You need the middle finger test. And so we are like, oh, yeah, you're actually right. Um, and so we started paying attention to these things. And here's some of our results. This is something called the SEMS-Weinstein uh, straw test. I, I won't bore you, bore you with the details. But on the left hand, on the right hand side, you can actually see the control group. Now red means decline, green means improvement. Now on the right hand side, we get the sort of random results you would expect from a control group. From the left hand side, the people who actually had the glove on for 10 hours a week, they showed significant improvement across all areas we tested. And that was quite, quite encouraging and quite a surprise. Again, these are people one year post-injury. And even better yet, when you look at the types of improvement they're getting, they actually cross these qualitative boundaries that people use when they're talking clinically about these types of injuries. 
We had people who actually could not feel it if they cut themselves. Right? They could bleed and not know they're hurt. And so having them cross the boundary between loss of protective sensation and just diminished protective sensation was a big deal. You can see some people transition from diminished sensation to actually normal. And so we had people crossing boundaries, and this was very exciting to us. Now, this is not, now, the other thing to notice here is that there's a trend. The people who started out the lowest had the most improvement. Now, this is not statistically significant. This is, this is just a trend of the data. But we're very encouraged by this for the future. Now, what's even more encouraging to us is the idea that uh, this actually can help our folks in their daily lives. We had people coming in who couldn't button their own buttons. They left the study being able to dress themselves. We had people who came in typing with one finger. They went out typing with four. And so we could actually see real changes in these folks' lives. Now, there's a lot of questions left over. Will these people actually uh, have continued these improvements? For that matter, will they continue playing piano? Will they continue this sort of rehab? But we're very encouraged by the last bit, because for, some, for our subjects, they said it's not rehabilitation, it's getting a new life skill. One of our pilot subjects said, hey, guys, can you actually hook me up with happy birthday? And we said, sure, why? I'd like to play, play happy birthday to my grandson. And so by the end of the week, he could actually play this song for his grandson. And for these folks, because it's music, it's not rehab, it's something they may actually continue working with in the future. And that's very exciting to us. Now, here's the challenge I have for, for all of you here. We've shown this effect called passive haptic learning. We're pretty sure it works. Uh, we have a first study on passive haptic rehabilitation. The question is, what's next? What can we do next with this? So could we help people learn how to type? Could we help people uh, recover from stroke? Most of us have family members who've actually been affected by stroke. Perhaps we can do passive, passive haptic rehabilitation for them. Could this help for MS or ALS? Where's the limits of this technique? If you actually learned a song, how long will you retain it? When we were doing another clip for CNN, they asked one of our subjects, Rick, who you saw there, uh, to come in and play Beethoven's Ode to Joy, the whole thing, not just a simple little clip, clip we did for live television. And Rick said, I don't, I don't know if I can do that. Let me try. He tried it and, and failed. He couldn't remember it. But we put the glove on for 10 minutes. And in 10 minutes, it all came back to him, which really kind of says that maybe there can be some extended learning here. So if you see me out there and you have a good idea, please tell me. We're trying to figure out where to go next with this. Now, of course, there's a lot of people who did this work. I'd like to thank Tanya Marco, who is my PhD student who did this, Dr. Debbie Bacchus at Shepherd Center. Um, but, um, and there's lots of other people who did a lot of work on this project. And just like in the movies, if you stay for the credits, I have a little Easter egg for you. For those of you who are interested in Google Glass, this is the first fully functional Google Glass made in December of 2010. It weighed over three kilograms. Thank you very much. <laughs>